If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to go to the book of Joel. You go, where is that? It's kind of after Isaiah and, well, it's somewhere in the middle of your Bible, J-O-E-L, after Amos. I want to start a two-part series. Today we're going to be in the book of Joel, and then next Sunday in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where I'm going to share a message that includes a good part of my testimony, how I came to the Lord, and 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 verse 17 is, is kind of my life verse. If, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things pass away, behold, all things become new. But in the book of Joel, if, you've, if you're there yet, um, chapter 2 is where we are. And I just want to set the stage a little bit. The people of God, the Israelites, had rebelled. They had disobeyed. They were unfaithful. And so God did what a faithful father has to do at times. He brought discipline. He, he brought correction. And he did it in an interesting way in the form of locusts to their fields, their crops. In fact, he called the locusts when he spoke to them. He called them, I sent among you my great army. And it was the locusts that destroyed their crops. And the land was devastated for a four-year period. It was a time of difficulty, a time of hardship, a time of stress. And the people, well, they begin to cry out. And they begin to ask God for forgiveness. They turn from their disobedience. And the prophet Joel records this amazing promise, a very powerful promise, and I would say also somewhat of a mysterious promise. Here's what he says in chapter 2, verse 25. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling, the consuming, the chewing, my great army which I sent among you. He says, I will restore. It's a mysterious promise. You say, well, what do you mean mysterious? Well, because how do you restore years? How do you give back years that have already gone by? I mean, I know you can restore a car. I've seen that done. You can restore, we pray, a bridge, right? You can restore that, I hope. <laughs> That's what we're looking for. You can restore a house, hopefully a relationship, but, but how do you get time back? How do you restore years? I mean, we know people try to look younger, restore years. There's anti-aging creams. That's a big industry. There's Botox. There's nips, tucks, and lifts. There's, there's hair plugs, testosterone shots, and on and on and on and on it goes. But you may put on a lot of cream, push in a lot of plugs, nip and tuck here, but you don't really get the years back. You don't get them. But God says here, I will restore the years the locusts have eaten. For four years they've been devastated. God hears their prayer. I mean, back in chapter 2, listen to the prayer as they begin to cry out in verse 18. Joel chapter 2. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. Verse 19, chapter 2. And, and the Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I'll send you grain, new wine, and oil. You'll be satisfied. I'll no longer make you a reproach among the nations. God is even going to deal with the enemies. He says, I, I, will, I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. Verse 20, I'll remove far from you the northern army. The armies had, had started coming into the land as, as they were weak, as they were devastated, as they were without nutrition and food and income. So he, he says, I'll deal with the enemy. 
I will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he's done monstrous things. Fear not, O land, he says. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord is doing marvelous things. Don't be afraid, you beasts of the field, you open pastures are springing up. The trees are going to bear its fruit. The fig tree and the vine will yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain, the latter rain, the first month. The threshing floors will be full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil. And then it sort of culminates our crescendos here in verse 25. So I will restore to you the years the swarming locusts have eaten. Wow. What this meant was God's going to give us back a harvest, one that was destroyed, an abundance to make up for that which was lost. The threshing floor will be full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil. And he says in verse 26, you shall eat in plenty, you'll be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wonderfully with you. What a great promise. What a great answer to a prayer. You might say, yeah, but John, that's, that's to the people of Israel. I'm not a farmer. I, I'm not a part of this promise. Well, I believe God puts promises in Scripture and that he says things like this, and he restores and he renews as a picture of who he is for all of us. In, in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 4, it says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of scriptures, might have hope. So God gives us this amazing scriptural promise for us to have hope. For us to realize that God can restore, God can renew the years that the locusts have eaten. What do locust years look like? Well, we know what they look like in Israel during this time and during this era of disobedience. But what do locust years look like in our lives for you and I? And how can God restore for you, for me, the years that the locusts have eaten? Locust years, wasted years, lost years, years you can't get back. How does God, God restore that? They come in all kinds of ways. And we can describe them, we can talk about them a little bit. Certainly, locust years for them, and I think for us, could be described because of their, their land becoming fallow and being eaten by locusts, you can call them Fruitless years, fruitless years. Locust years in a person's life, I would describe as fruitless years. The land doesn't bear any crops. Nothing's being produced. It's a, it's a lean time in someone's life. Maybe that's been you. Maybe, maybe you planted, maybe you had expectations, maybe you planned, maybe you plowed, maybe you did all this work. And it's all taken by the locusts. Maybe it's a job. And you, you, you got that new job or whatever it was, and, or you started a new business, or, or you made an investment, and you thought, this is going to be it, this is how it's going to work, this is, this is the way we're going to go forward in the future. But all that work, all that planning, all the possibilities that you saw never really produced. It was a locust year, or it's been several of them. Fruitlessness. That can be a locust year. Another locust year, I think, in someone's life is a, is a time of sorrow or a sorrowful year where something happens. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. Someone dies. And you and that person had great plans. Man, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to move forward. 
This is what life is going to look like for the next five, ten years, and, and suddenly this person is gone, and all those dreams and all the future that you laid out, it's just not going to be there. Everything's different. Or maybe it's a sickness, an illness that comes into your life, and, and suddenly the life you had, the, the anticipation, expectation that was all about, and it's, it's gone. I can't do it now. I've got this sickness, or I've got this illness, or... This change of health and things now have to be lived completely different. I had a good friend that um, was on track to be probably a a very uh, successful professional surfer. And he had an injury. And all that he thought he would do with his life, all that he thought he would accomplish, and, and he was going there too, all because of an injury, changed his whole life. And he went into kind of this funk for a while. And it was, in my opinion, it was sort of a a locus lifestyle for him in some way. All the trips and the plans and the money. You can have fruitless years. You can have sorrowful years. I think you can also have, I would describe locus years sometimes as selfish years. Where it's all about you. And where God has spoken and given direction and guidance, and you decided, no, no, I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to do what I want to do. It's all about your stuff, and it's all about your trips, and it's all about your plans, and it's all about your money, and it's all about you. And you find out after a while it's kind of shallow, it's kind of superficial, it's kind of all based on me. And, and I, would, I would describe that as... as uh, Locusts, eating up years of your life that God had meant to be for maybe something else. And somehow maybe during that year, some, during that locust time, you wake up. You come to yourself. If you're not careful, locust years can, can go on for a long, long time. And you wake up halfway through life and go, oh my gosh, what did I do? Where did it go? What do I do now? How do I get back to where I want to be? Now, this is a cheery message, right? It's, a, it's an uplifting message. <laughs> We're going to talk about how God restores, but I just want to describe a little bit about what locust life looks like. It can be what I call loveless years, loveless years, where there's a disagreement maybe in the family. And, and the family breaks apart. Well, we're not talking to that part of the family anymore. We're not getting together with them anymore. Or, 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 and, and, and time just kind of marches on, as you know, and children are growing up and families are moving and changing. Uh, locust years can be loveless years where a marriage stagnates. Well, we're married, but it's cold, it's stagnant, we're just together. Loveless years. You see a couple holding hands and laughing, enjoying themselves somewhere, and, and, you, and you begin to process, and you think, boy, I would love to have that. Love to have that in my life. But you're in the midst of a locust year. Or maybe you're here, and, and you say, John, I'm not married. I've never met that person. I've not come to a place where where God's brought into my life that person that I prayed for and dreamed of and thought about, and and you see the years going by, and you think, man, I'm, I'm, I'm living the locust years. Locust years can be rebellious years, like the prodigal son who grew up in a wonderful home. Father gave him everything. The prodigal daughter, you grew up with blessings and in a Christian family, but but you had this instinct within you to to rebel, to try to see what's out there, to find out what else life could be possibly about. And you give yourself to what you know is wrong. And you become who you're not supposed to be. And instead of pleasure, you find a lot of pain there find a lot of difficulty, find a lot of hurt. 
and you finally come to yourself like the prodigal did, and you, and you regret, you, you say, I, I, I want to go back, and, but the locusts have eaten all those years. Maybe you made a decision during that time that was ungodly, or maybe it wasn't so ungodly. Maybe it wasn't that evil, but, but you hoped and sort of thought, this is the way to live. I can do this, kind of have God and not have Him, but it all sort of ended in a dead end. Life doesn't seem to work or fit for you, and you look back, and a lot of people do look back, and they say, if only I had done that, or if only I had not done that, if only I had made that choice instead of that choice. If only I'd gone down this road instead of that road, but now I can't go back. And there's this sense of, of locust years. And let me say this, here, here's another way to look at locust years. I would call it Christless years. Christless years. Years where you've never made a commitment to Christ. Maybe you're here today and you've never done that. Or you're that prodigal. Christless years. I mean, you can ask anyone who came to the Lord late in life, and they'll tell you, oh my gosh, I wish I would have known the Lord when I was younger. All the time I wasted, all the things I did, all the roads I went down, they would tell you they were wasted until they came to Christ. Over and over you hear that story. Oh, I wish I would have come to the Lord sooner. I would have avoided so much pain, so many bad decisions. Life would have been so different. A lot of ways to come to a place where we have a sense of missed or lost years, opportunities, and you feel like you can't go back. I mean, I came to the Lord at 18. But I look back at 16, and I dropped out of high school. And I was a terrible student. Oh, I was good at cheating. Don't get me wrong. I knew how to copy off other people's tests and papers. But at 16, I decided I was so smart and, and you know, capable, I didn't need school. And at 18, I came to the Lord, and, I, and my mom wanted me to go back, and I thought, well, how can I go back? That's embarrassing. I'm 18, these, you know, but I went back to adult high. Not the easiest place to go. And I think about the locust years in my own life, so many roads I went down and things I did. So, so this promise, this statement, where, where the Lord says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. It's a mystery to me. It's a mysterious truth, amazing promise. So, Lord, how, how can you do that? How can you give me what, what I've already wasted or walked away from? John, it's for Israel. It's for farmers. It, well, it's also for people like you and I. Listen, listen to the prayer again in verse 17 where he says, let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. And here's what you have him say. Spare your people, O Lord, and do not give reproach to your name, to your heritage. They begin to pray. And basically, they say, Lord, spare your people. Or if I could put it into another word, have mercy on your people. Spare your people, O Lord. This is the cry. This is the prayer that's going up. Spare your people, O Lord. Spare your people, O Lord. It reminds me of, of Romans 8, chapter, verse 32, when it speaks of Jesus as he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for all of us. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Spare your people. And as you and I ask for mercy, we are spared because Jesus was not spared. The, the promise is for people, this restoration of years that the locusts have eaten is for people who pray for his mercy, who pray to be spared. 
Our confidence is this, when you come for mercy and grace and help, the promise of restoration of years is given to those who recognize their need for mercy. That's what they recognize. We need God's mercy. We need his help. And also people who want to see God's name honored, do not give your heritage to reproach. So, so let me have your attention. Here's who God gives the years to that the locusts ate, people who pray for mercy and people who pray that God's name might be honored. And that's what they begin to pray. The promise of restored years is given to those who recognize this need. That the prayer begins in this, this statement to the Lord. Lord, why should people say, where is your God? Let the priests minister to the Lord. We uh, spare them. Do not give a hand. That the nations should rule over them. Why should, it says, they say among the peoples, where is their God? It's like saying, Lord, restore these years. Lord, spare. Have mercy for Jesus' sake, for your glory, for your name. Lord, for mercy for me. And God, because of Jesus, God taking Jesus and, and not sparing him can spare me, can restore you, can help me. See, see, God answers in verse 19, and he says, The Lord will answer and say to his people, I send you grain, new wine, and oil. You'll be satisfied with them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. God says, I'm going to do it. And it culminates the answer to his prayer in verse 25 when he says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. So a person who has those years restored is a person who is aware of their need for mercy and a desire to honor his name. That's how it starts. You say, well, that's great. I need mercy. I want God's name honored. So how does God restore the years that the locusts have eaten? Well, we'll take a 20-minute break. And we, no, no. Here's what I believe. God can restore the lost years, number one, by growing and enriching and deepening your commitment and your relationship with Jesus Christ. He'll make it stronger. He'll make it deeper. He'll make it more vital. He'll make it more real than ever before. Look what it says in verse 27. As the Lord is answering, as he's giving his promise, he says, then... When I restore those years, when I, when I give you the grain and the new wine, then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. The promise is this, hey, I'm going to come into your midst. I'm going to come into your life in a greater sense, in a greater presence than you've ever known, God will give a greater sense of himself that there is none like him in all your world. That's how it begins. The, the New Testament tells a story, and I, I want to read a part of it to you that I think describes this a little bit. It's in the Gospel of Luke. Just listen, you don't have to turn there. It says, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, and she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house. She had had an encounter with Jesus already. So she came in, and she brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. You guys know this story. And she stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. And when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, the Pharisee did, and said, this, this man, if he were really a prophet, he'd know who and what manner of woman this is who's touching him, for she's a, she's a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Okay, teacher, say it. 
He said there was a creditor who had two debtors, one owed five denarii, 500 denarii, another 50, and, and when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Which one do you think loved him more? And Simon answered, well, I suppose the one he forgave more. He said, you're right. He said, you, you see this woman. I entered your house. You, you gave me no water for my feet, which was customary. You, you didn't wash them. She's washed them with her tears and with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has, has, has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Now, here's the picture. They're all sitting around having dinner with Jesus. How, how amazing would that be? And what great fellowship. Hey, we're having dinner with Jesus. But in comes another person who has a totally different experience with Jesus than all those sitting around the table with Jesus. And that experience is one of, of gratitude and repentance and honor and worship and depth and intimacy like no one else in the room is having. And this is what I'm talking about. Some people sit in a room and have a certain kind of relationship with Jesus. They've not asked for mercy. They, they, they've not realized how great he is. They don't have an intimacy with him. There is a difference in intimacy in these pictures between two people who are in the same room with the same Jesus. When Jesus, uh, I think, speaks to this situation, he said, do you see the difference here between what's going on with this woman and what's going on with you, Simon? She recognizes her need for mercy. She recognizes her need for grace. She's crying out and asking for it. This is the story of Joel. He says, I will restore the years as you cry out for mercy, as you recognize your need for me. And that, then I will be in your midst like you've never, ever had me before. And I would submit to you that that's the situation with a lot of people who are in the midst of locust years. They've, they've gotten to the place where, oh, I don't need anything, I'm good. And they kind of put their faith on autopilot. And, and one way I think that God restores the years that the locusts have eaten is by bringing to you a place of your need for him and also an intimacy and a relationship, a deeper communion and relationship than you've ever had before. That's how it starts. Ask the Lord. Listen, in 2021, ask the Lord for a deeper or maybe for some, a first-time relationship with him. To restore the years the locusts have eaten. God desires to do it. He did it for Israel. He did it for a lesson for us, for us also to have hope in all the scriptures that have been written. And he wants to do it for you. He wants to do it for me. God wants to restore the years in your life that you perhaps feel like the locusts have eaten. And one of the ways he does that is deeper intimacy and deeper relationship. Another way he does it is multiplying your fruitfulness. Multiplying it. The harvest was lost for four years. Now they have an enormous harvest. Larger than they've ever had before. God multiplied what they had lost and gave it back to them in a way they've never, ever experienced. Listen, listen to this parable Jesus tells. He says, behold, behold, a sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seed, and it fell by the wayside, and the birds came and ate it. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they sprang up, but there was no depth. And the sun scorched it. There's no root. It withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But, but here's, here's the good part. Others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. D did you hear that? Some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred. 
Did, did you know that three years of a hundredfold is the same as 10 years at 30-fold? Wouldn't you like to have the three years at a hundredfold? Where God multiplies 10 times what he did for someone else? It's, it's God taking... And multiplying like he did for Israel. I'm going to give you a greater harvest. I'm going to give you back what you lost in an amazing way. You know, at, at, at 16, I dropped out of high school. Then 18, I, I got saved. And, and I was a high school dropout. And I thought, well, how could I ever go to college? My parents didn't have a lot of money. Now, I'll share a little bit next week how God worked an amazing miracle to pay for my college. Now, here's a high school dropout who thought he would never finish high school, finish his college, then goes on to seminary and gets a master's degree and comes back and plants a church in his own hometown. The odds of that, <laughs> they're not there. They're totally not there. And to have a life that God's given me with uh, kids and the Lord knows how many grandkids, we're, we're, we're still counting the process. And, and the fruitfulness, I can look back on my life and go, how did this happen? God multiplied beyond. More lasting fruit. So here's what I say to you. If you feel like, God, I, I've just wasted or I've missed or I, I got out of sync, I, 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 I rebelled, whatever it did. Ask the Lord for greater fruit to multiply your fruit in the years you have ahead of you. He's able to do that. Spurgeon once said this, God can do more in a year or a day than you and I could do in a lifetime. It's like the story of the little boy who shows up with five loaves and a couple of fish and nobody knows, well, how are we going to feed this giant crowd? There's not enough food. There's not enough money. It can't happen. Well, there's a kid over here with a couple of fish and some bread. Well, we'll bring him to me. And God takes what's in his hands, and multiplies it in a way that no one could have ever imagined. I remember sitting over here in our little sanctuary with about 100 people thinking and looking at all this land that God had given us. It was just a real miracle that we were able to purchase it the way we did and thinking as we looked over, the church was growing, thinking we will never, ever be able to afford a sanctuary bigger than the one we're in. It just can't happen. Guess what? kind of happened. And God was the one in the midst of it. He just made it happen. God can do more in a year or a day than we can do in a lifetime. God can give you a greater sense of expectation. God can give you a greater sense of fruit. God can give you a greater sense of faith. God can give you a greater harvest. Why not ask God for that? Why not? You have not because you ask not. Well, God, I just want to live in the locust years. Really? That's where you want to live? Without fruit, without, without a sense of expectation, anticipation? There, there's an amazing verse, and I'll read it for you in the book of Isaiah, where Isaiah prophesies about Jesus. And he says this, it's a, it's a powerful statement. Isaiah says, he'll be cut off from the land of the living. Wow. Wow. Think about Jesus, three years in ministry, just three, and at 33 years old, 33, he's cut off from the land of the living. He, he takes your judgment and my judgment upon himself, the sins of others, yours and mine. Listen to what it says. Who's believed our report? Who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Has he revealed it to you, to me? For he shall grow up like a, a tender plant out of a root of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness that we should see him. There's no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected by men, sorrowful, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces, 
He was despised and we did not esteem him. He's talking about Jesus and the crucifixion. Surely he's borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. 33 years old, three years of ministry. Listen to what it says. His chastisement of peace was upon him. By his stripes were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity iniquity of us all. He's oppressed. He was afflicted. He opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before his shears, he's silent. He did not open his mouth. He was taken from prison, from judgment. Who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living. Here's what happened. Our locusts swarmed Jesus, and he was cut off from the land of the living. God's tender shoot. But the good news is, on the third day, he rose victorious. Amen? He rose victorious. And he can restore to you and I the years that the locusts have eaten. Listen, I'm not a politician. I don't know what the future holds for our nation politically. I can't watch the news anymore. I'm not a stockbroker. I can't tell you what the market's going to do after January 20th. I don't know. I'm not an envir environmentalist. I don't know if there's global warming or not. Who does? But I do know this. I'm a pastor. And I've been teaching this and doing this for like 38 years. And one thing I do know is God restores. God works miracles in people's lives. God saves. God, God changes. God gives fruit where we're thinking, oh man, I can't bear any more fruit, God. I've wasted myself. God is a God who keeps his promises. And I would submit to you, if you're here today, and you say, John, I, I, um, I'm in the middle of a locust year. I'm in the middle of a lot of locust years. Well, I, I want you to, to be encouraged. I want you to listen. He says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. I'll do it with intimacy. I'll do it with fruit. I'll do it with giving you a sense of my presence in a way you've never had before. You don't have to feel cut off. All you have to do is recognize your need for mercy and have a desire to honor his name. That's what they did. That's what he did. That's what he can do. That's what he will do in a person's life. You have not because you ask not. Listen, the enemy would love to take advantage of you in a locust year. To even take more from you that God has allowed you to lose. Because of disobedience or because of rebellion or because of prodigal, whatever it is, the enemy has come to kill and steal and rob and take from you all that God desires to give. I know I've been there. At that little age of 16 and then 18, the enemy wanted to take from me a life that God had planned for me. But because I recognize my need for mercy, and had a desire, that a God-given desire, I think he gives it to us all to honor his name, and I cried out. God says, John, let me give to you, in a way you wouldn't imagine, the years that the locusts have eaten. And I'm no one special at all. Ask my wife. She'll say, he is no one special. <laughs> With all certitude, 